Every scar is a lesson. And I teach as violently as I learn. It is the only way to be remembered, these scars. You see, they build their legacies. Buildings burn. Ha! I carve mine into the earth! Let these great kingdoms try to forget my lessons. Let them be afraid to speak my name. Irsu comes, royal ducklings. He is a warty old crocodile with a thousand scars. He brings chaos, anarchy, blood in the water. Waddle into my reach, ducklings. The old crocodile is coming! <laughs> Words of wisdom from a terrifying man. We join Irsu on turn 40 outside Kantap, the last stronghold of the Halab people. We're deep into our quest to liberate the Hittites of their worldly possessions, and what a journey we've been on so far. We started with a humble dream of bringing central Canaan to heal, and I suppose we acquired a taste for blood along the way. Now a ring of military forts protects our territory, which we no longer wish to grow, and ruin lays beyond our borders. Ruin we mean to bring to the Egyptians and Hittites in equal measure, because why should they be happy? Whilst Irsu ravages Anatolia, his two generals Dagon and Haddad brave the Mediterranean in search of fresh spoils. Egypt thrashes itself into crisis, the Hittites war over a dusty throne, and mysterious raiders arrive in silent waves along the coast. Civilization rests on a bed of kindling, and Irsu is only too eager to set it ablaze. Look out, Kantap, we're invading on three fronts. Front one puts Habaru raiders in the thick of it whilst reinforcements catch up. Front two is a slow advance, we're hoping to draw them out a little here. And front three is our right hook. There are significant reinforcements inbound from a nearby fort and Irsu's hoping to thrash them silly before they can make it into the settlement proper. Fire arrows to lower their morale and cut off their escape through the trees whilst the rest of our units box them in and decimate them. Some are making it through our Habru line, so we'll send Irsu and our Sabun Nagib warriors to head them off whilst our spearmen round the trapped units in. A few battered units have made it through, but if Kantap was relying on their reinforcements to save them, then they'd best find a new strategy. Fronts 2 and 1 are progressing well, if only serving to keep the bulk of the defenders occupied. I don't love that the routers are getting away. Let's see about cutting them off with some fire. A lovely patch of grass and trees is the perfect spot to focus our flaming arrows. <laughs> I think someone's enjoying themselves. Have we, um... Do you think we've overdone it with the fire? No. No. Definitely not. Front one's almost broken through. We'll flank with our Sabu Nagib warriors and set them to reckless advance. The hit to our defence won't matter when we're crushing our foes against swords and axes. At this point, we're no strangers to victory, but a freshly raised settlement does put a smile on the face. Isu's marauding Canaanites are experts at stripping a settlement of all it's worth. 
We'll use the spoils to fund our ever-growing armies and, back home, build monuments to our greatness. Speaking of back home, Dagon and her dad are setting sail. Hopefully they find some food. Sacking and raising means we're not in danger of starving anytime soon, and there's still bountiful, fertile lands to sully. However, it doesn't hurt to put some of that hard-won stone to good use and build ourselves a smuggler's market. Whilst we're gleefully ushering in the end of the world, disorder explodes and our underhanded scheming results in a stocked larder. Times of prosperity sees a smaller yield for us, so we've a vested interest in sowing chaos. You'll be pleased to know that all the wealth we've amassed thus far has been honestly earned, or taken from people who honestly earned it. That means not a single trade deal in sight. But why? Well, Isu really likes killing, and honestly, I do too. Thankfully, in Total War Pharaoh, you're free to experience the collapse of the Bronze Age however you see fit. For me, I wanted to play how I thought Isu would. To that end, I've turned off the ability to initiate trading, because why trade when you can take? I've increased character movement because I think Isu would push his men to their limits, and I've toyed with settings that get us into big fights quickly. I've also turned off the ability to retreat from battles because Isu suffers no coward. I'm probably going to regret that one. Tier 5 Chieftain's Estate and some advanced resource buildings will set our mind at ease whilst Isu and his generals explore pastures new. Hello, who are you? Dagon's tentatively turning back because that's an attack hat if ever I saw one. Trading outposts aren't technically against my no trade rule and if you've got a problem with that, take it up with Moloch. What is this, some kind of sea person? Let's see how they fare against my ambushing slingers. Whilst Dagon defends our borders, Isu and her dad take the fight abroad. Fire arrows to spook them, and a spear wall to block them in. That's how we deal with chariots. Ambushing slingers and javelins make light work of an armoured unit's flanks. Sly Egyptians hid their spearmen in with their slingers, porting the charge. Well, it looks like Dagon's sticking around for a while. Her dad will have to face Egypt alone. But it's not all doom and gloom. That went well. I mean, it is, but we want it to be. Anyway, more sea peoples means more cracks in the foundations of civilization means more food coming into our market. In other words, the sea peoples are kind of our frenemies right now. Together, we'll bring the world to its knees, but preferably at a distance from each other. And you know what? If the world's ending, let's see about hedging our bets on the old god front. A second deity slot means more boons, another dedicated general, and just a dash of variety. During our conquesting, we settled two new outposts which we'll use as pit stops and fallbacks along our violent way. Yet, in a fun twist of fate, both Tagama and Peyunaman happen to occupy sacred lands of their respective cultures. Meaning our warmongering, fire-loving, master of raid and pillaging Isu himself is eligible to make a grab at Pharaoh or High King. It's, it's a tempting prospect, provided we put in the necessary work to amass the needed legitimacy. But we should always ask ourselves WWID. What would Isu do? And Isu would laugh, melt both crowns and forge them into a spear or something equally as sharp. Yeah, they can keep their lofty thrones and their stupid big buildings. We're all about tearing the world down, not building it up. No throne for me. So We've just hit level 16, which opens up a new title slot. We've already unlocked two of our wanted titles, Overseer of Foreign Tribute and Lord of Ruin, both designed to bolster our devilish raiding ways. We're heading towards a glorious devastator, but we're still a little way off, so we'll apply Heart of Stone in the meanwhile. After all, reduced unit upkeep's nothing to sniff at. 
A worthy general knows their reputation is only as good as their actions, and strong actions require the best equipment. In our pillaging thus far, we've discovered a nice variety of ancillaries, from armor to weapons, mounts to shields, and everything in between. Here, we can shape our bodyguards to our will. Light armor wearing bowmen, heavy defenders, solid all-rounders, or even chariot chargers. Our bodyguards can fulfill any role we demand of them. We've recently discovered a nice, strong axe which we'll give to our bodyguards. Bows are a coward's weapon, and chariots aren't personal enough for Irsu. We can acquire further ancillaries to apply to our army, affecting things like line of sight, battle loot, aura size, and more. We're still looking to reduce our food upkeep, so we'll replace our sash with the scythe of quality. Items aren't an instant swap like weapons, armor, shields, and mounts, so we'll need to wait a turn until our lovely new scythe arrives. Back home and Dagon should prepare for more invaders. We'll drop off a few of our more expendable units in a nearby fort and start recruiting some veteran Canaanite swordsmen and light Syrian archers. These are expensive tier 3 units earned through our upgraded native recruitment office and should give any invaders pause for fort. There's no wall tall enough to keep Irsu away, and the sooner we're battling in the streets, the better our chances of victory. Our second front has encountered more resistance than we were hoping for, and getting through the gates is looking unlikely. The walls are our only option. Once inside, the streets ignite with Irsu's rage. We'll advance on the capture points and beat back any reinforcements we encounter. Across the Mediterranean, her dad seeks his own fortunes. We've surrounded Sai and advanced on four fronts with an infantry and chariot split. Our goal is to sandwich Sai's defenders between shield and chariot whilst our fleet-footed units hunt down the capture points. That's what we call a death corridor. Wouldn't it be ironic if we got trapped in one later? Ah, an ambition. These helpful options pop up from time to time, guiding us towards optional, short-term goals. This one should help me beat back the relentless tide of the Sea Peoples. They're everywhere, and her dad's a little trapped. But Dagon's not faring much better, and the latest invaders caught me in a bad mood. We've been forced into the mud, a death sentence for heavy units, but we'll counter it by ordering our men to give ground. This lures the hapless foe forward, allowing us room to flank. The Egyptian sea people threat has been neutralized by Ramesses, but he's also very rudely taken by Uniman. Haddad's recovering, but his retreat's blocked. We'll need to send Dagon to rescue him. Elsewhere, Irsu's living his best life at the expense of the Hittites. <laughs> Dagon moves on Payuniman, giving her dad the courage to attempt to retreat. And what's one little raising going to hurt? Oh no. Her dad was so close to reuniting with Dagon, but the gods may have other plans, and Ramesses is eager to defend his homeland. We've taken the hill and mean to hold it against the attacking Egyptians. Ordering our men to hold should give us stability against Ramesses' chariots. At least until our own can wade into the fray and show them how it's done. I will loot your gods when I... Yeah. 
The dad fought hard and took the Egyptian's poster boy with him. A warrior through and through. Let's replace him with this guy. Our invasion of Egypt hasn't gone too well so far, but with Pakat and Dagon together, we can set our sights on more ambitious prey. Per Wajet looks a formidable settlement, no doubt brimming with treasures. We'll begin our siege shortly. Whilst our Egyptian front flounders, Irsu has been busy raking in the goods. But the deeper we press, the more formidable foes we uncover, and with the discovery of Kinder, we at last face a worthy opponent. Karunta, the psychotic and power-hungry prince of Hattusa, would have been great king if not for his cousin, a warlord with a grudge to bear and deep, deep pockets. Irsu couldn't ask for a greater match. This ball just grew horns. Before we commit to a full-scale war with Grintha, we'll hike back to Samua and finish them off. The last thing we need is a loose end pulling us away from a good fight. Dagon and Pagat prepare for their attack, but more sea peoples darken our horizon. A new general to protect our land should keep Isu in the field, and, with Samua turned to ash, nothing stands between us and Karintha. But the Sea Peoples are relentless, and so are we. Civilization is slipping deeper into collapse, and the glorious battle Irsu was promised has been stolen from him by raiding Sea Peoples. Still, a fight is a fight, and these Sea Peoples are rapidly slipping from frenemy status to just plain old enemy. In Egypt, Sea Peoples and Civil War has sown chaos, and we're hoping the battered Egyptians are too distracted to notice our invasion force. Of course, without the ability to retreat, every conflict initiated is a gamble. Ah, ooh, well. Well, live by the sword, die by the sword. We'll at least give them a black eye. As the door likely closes on our Egyptian expedition for the meanwhile, we'll try our best to keep Isu in the field. If Akat can repel these troublesome sea peoples, we should be able to keep the resources rolling in. Gods help me if Isu has to march all the way home. Mm, the laws of RP compel me to act potentially not in my best interest here. But Isu's probably foaming at the mouth with the injustice of being denied his prize. So let's see about enacting some ill-advised vengeance. No mercy. The deepest scars hold the greatest lessons. Mine taught me to take until you can't. Fill your pockets with coin and blood. If you cannot eat or spend it, burn it. Give it to the warty old crocodiles with the scars, and watch them thrash! If you see a dawn, do it again, and again, and again! So long as they build, we destroy! So long as they breathe, we hunt! <laughs> <laughs> 